and later he joined uh, J Jeffrey Hinton's lab as a postdoc. After moving to industry, he was one of the first uh, members of the Google Brain team and the founding member of the Facebook AI Research Lab. And since then, he has been interested in machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and more generally, artificial intelligence. In particular, his focus has been on enabling machines to learn from weaker supervision and how to effectively transfer knowledge across tasks, possibly leveraging the compositional structure of natural signals. Uh, today, I'm, I'm excited to, to, to present his uh, talk on low resource, resource machine translation. And uh, please, Marco Aurelio, it's all yours. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Matteo. <laughs> And, thank, uh, and I would like to thank all the organizers for inviting me today. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, and so I'm going to talk about low resource machine translation. And this is a continuation of Orhan lectures from this morning. Um, and it is going to be about how to apply what he described to low resource languages. So languages for which you don't have a lot of uh, supervised data to train. And since this is a machine learning school, uh, I'm going to take the machine learning perspective and see how um, classical machine learning approaches can be used to build these systems. So uh, uh, a little bit echoing what Mata was saying, uh, my interest has been about uh, learning with uh, weaker supervision. And I've been pursuing this across three avenues. Uh, one is about leveraging unlabeled data. So I've been doing quite a bit of work on unsupervised learning. Uh, and uh, during this talk, I will um, touch a little bit on our work on unsupervised machine translation, for instance. Another avenue is uh, um, learning uh, with less labeled data because you can leverage the knowledge that you uh, accrued on similar tasks. And so we have been doing quite a bit of work on continual learning, few shot learning, meta learning. And the third uh, direction is um, uh, being more sample efficient because of inductive biases. So much of the data that we use has, uh, for instance, compositional structure. So if you take text, a document is composed by paragraphs, paragraphs are composed by sentences, sentences into, uh, can be decomposed into phrases and so on and so forth. And so the question is, if our architecture has also the same uh, inductive biases, can we learn more efficiently? Because now a new concept can be expressed as the composition of known primitives. And so this is a little bit what I'm interested in, just to give you a context. And um, during this lecture, I'm going to focus on the first thing, how to uh, leverage unlabeled data for NLP. And so uh, let me recall a little bit the uh, basics of machine translation. Um, eventually we want to build a predictor that takes a sentence and produces a translation. Let's say we want to translate from English to Italian. And so uh, you start with the data, right? So we have a bunch of parallel sentences. So a sentence in English with a corresponding translation in Italian. And then uh, we use this data to train uh, a sequence to sequence uh, neural machine translation system. Uh, Orhan this morning, I believe, uh, talked about transformers. And so all you need to do is to um, uh, predict uh, the Italian translation given the English source sentence. And we do this by stochastic gradient descent. The problem simplifies to uh, a bunch of classification tasks, one for each token using uh, a predictor that is autoregressive, right? And then at this time, given a new English sentence, uh, the prediction is simply a search over the space of possible target sentences uh, in Italian for what is that sentence that maximizes the probability given uh, the input uh, uh, source sentence. And this is done approximately by using beam decoding. Now, if we step back a little bit, you will realize that we made already two assumptions here. So the first assumption is that the two languages, English and Italian, are fairly related. The second assumption is that we have enough training data to train the neuromachine translation system. 
And so one question is whether these two assumptions are always well satisfied. And so it turns out that in the world there are 6,500 or so uh, languages, and not perhaps not including dialects. And so, um, you know, in research we have oftentimes a very um, Eurocentric and North American centric view of the world, but it turns out that even English is spoken by 5% uh, of the population as uh, first language. And so um, if you look at how many people speak a, a, a single language, you find that uh, if you put together the first top most spoken uh, 10 languages, you cover about half of, the, uh, half of the world population. So there is a very long tail of languages that are spoken by relatively few people. And so the question is, how can we do automated translation for these languages? If you look at commercial systems like, uh, you know, your Microsoft, Google Translate, uh, Yandex, and, and so on and so forth, they cover roughly 100 languages or so. So that's the head of the head of, of, of this distribution, right? And so the question is, can we walk down this, um, this tail of languages? And here I'm stealing a slide from Horan this morning. And it turns out that uh, here in light gray, there is the, uh, the amount of parallel data for a, a given language. And on the dark gray, there is uh, the quality of the machine translation system or the corresponding machine translation system. It turns out that as you decrease the amount of parallel data, the, the translation quality decreases. Uh, and at some point also quite drastically. So building automatically machine translation systems for low, low resource languages is a big challenge. And so let's go back to our uh, toy illustration. And now instead of considering English Italian, let's consider English Nepali. And Nepali is the language spoken in Nepal, obviously. And that's not such a small country. It's already 25 million people, uh, not to count the Nepali people around the world, right? So um, the picture is the following. So we have very few uh, parallel data in practice, right? And uh, if we want to do this exercise for real, what we would do is go to this website that uh, is the public repository of all uh, parallel uh, corpora. If you enter English Nepali, you'll find that uh, these are the publicly available documents, okay? And in particular, uh, the most, uh, um, uh, those that are the biggest ones are uh, JW300, which is a religious magazine from uh, Jehovah Witnesses, I believe. And then you have Genome and KDE, which is Ubuntu handbooks. So you will agree with me that already these two domains are not the most promising if you want, let's say, to translate uh, English news into Nepali. And then you have other sources that like Wikimatrix, Paracraw, that have quite a bit of data in terms of number of sentences, but these are automatically generated. They are not human translated. So the point is that um, already for Nepali, which is not even the most low resource language, we have access only to very little data from a variety of domains, which is not what you really want, and also with varying quality. And so the machine learning problem is pretty challenging here. <clears throat> All right, so let's walk through uh, this exercise of building an English Nepali machine translation system. And let's represent with uh, um, uh, with the um, uh, field rectangle, uh, the, uh, the training data. In particular, the blue rectangle are the English sentences and the red re rectangle represents the, the corresponding Nepali translations, okay? It turns out that some sentences originate from English and some originates from Nepali. And the two domains may not even be the same. So it could be that your training set part originates from English and perhaps there are sentences taken from the Bible because the Bible turns out to be translated in all possible languages. So that, that's one resource that we have. 
And the other half of the data set perhaps is parliamentary data uh, from the Nepali government. And that's translated into English, okay? But you may agree with me that what you want to translate is not a novel sentence from the Bible, right? So you want to translate, let's say, English news, right? And so your test set comes from the news domain, okay? So on the vertical axis, we have the domain. But you, you may not have parallel data in, in the news domain. Perhaps the best that you can hope for is to get just monolingual data. So just a collection of sentences in, in the news domain without their corresponding translation. So we, we may have some news from Nepali newspapers and news from English speaking countries in English, but they are not a translation of each other. Okay, so already here you see that the machine learning problem is pretty interesting, right? Because what you want is to translate a sentence from the test set, which is English news, but you don't have any uh, supervision in that domain. You only have a little bit of supervision in other domains and, and it's not even much data. To further complicate matters, you may have actually additional data in other languages than English Nepali. You may have some parallel data in English Hindi. And this is actually English Hindi is considered high resource because you can find a lot of parallel sentences there, but it may be in another domain, right? And so here the hope is that because Nepali and Hindi belong to the same language family, if you want, let's say to translate between Nepali and English, if now you use parallel data from Hindi English, you may improve also translation between Nepali and English because the two languages, because Nepali and Hindi are related. So in practice, what you have is this um, kind of diagram where you have a lot of different domains on the vertical axis and a lot of different, sorry, uh, I guess it depends how you see it. A lot of uh, different domains across the rows and a lot, a lot of different languages across the columns, okay? And you have data coming from different domains, different languages, varying quality. And so it's like uh, a, a Mondrian um, painting. And this is what I call the Mondrian-like learning setting. And this is not what you find in, you know, in uh, this is not the standard classical machine learning uh, setting that you find in books, right? And so the question is, how can you leverage all this data to, you know, ultimately improve the uh, translation quality in English Nepali? And so low resource machine translation for me, it is the problem of building a machine translation system on a language pair that has roughly less than 10,000 uh, parallel sentences. And this is little compared to the, the number of parameters that modern neural machine translation systems have. We are talking about 100 million parameters, even more. Today, uh, I saw uh, a new article from our friends at Google Brain where they uh, propose a one trillion parameter model, right? So and if you look at um, uh, textbook definition, you will need at least three data points to estimate each single parameter. So here we are, we are way less than that. And so there are several challenges. So there is a challenge related to the data set. So how to uh, put together a data set to train a machine translation system, of course. There is the challenge also of evaluation. So it is even hard to find good uh, benchmarks to evaluate your low resource machine translation system. It is difficult to build such benchmarks because it is difficult to find professional translators in those languages. It is difficult to assess the quality of their translations automatically. Uh, there are challenges related to the metrics. How do you assess uh, with humans when you know, there is a high variance in, in the quality of their job? How to do automatic evaluation? There are some languages for which they don't even segment words. And so what is the unit that you should be using? Um, in general, evaluating text generation is an open research problem. There are challenges related to modeling. So what, how do you frame 
the learning uh, problem in this case? How do you uh, build systems that generalize? And then if you think about uh, low resource machine translation is about training with lots and lots of data. And so there is, because you have all these different data sets, auxiliary data sets. And so uh, how do you scale? How do you uh, train efficiently? And so the first take home message is that perhaps counterintuitively, at least when I started, <laughs> I thought, well, low resource machine translation, I need to come up with tricks to make it work on a small data set. But in fact, you need to, uh, it is about large scale uh, learning. Uh, and so the general ML tip is that whenever you lack supervision, you need to come up with ways to uh, compensate for it. In particular, can you come up with auxiliary tasks? Can you fantasize the, the data that you lack? And this is what this talk is going to be about. And so for me, machine translation is a lot of those machine translation is interest because it aligns with my research interests that, that I uh, briefly uh, explained at the very beginning. It is about learning with little in-domain uh, parallel data supervision uh, on a problem that is structured, that has composition elements. And it is a problem where if we make progress, uh, many people can benefit. So it, it is a, a real practical application. And so in general, when I do research, I, uh, it is a um, evolving uh, process where I cycle through three pillars. The first one is data, right? So you have a problem and you need to find data that exposes the problem, right? And then once you have a data set, then you can come up with a model that can fit that data, right? And then once you have a model, you need to analyze. You need to analyze the mistakes that the model does, how well the model fits the data. You need to uh, understand the properties of the data. And perhaps you realize that uh, a much a more interesting problem is something else. And for that, you need to collect some other data. And so you go around the circle again. And here I'm putting some references of mostly of the work that I've been doing with my collaborators, but not only. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on three, uh, these three papers, okay? Um, right, so let me, uh, so I talked about the motivation as to what is low resource machine translation and why we are doing this. And next is the core of this lecture. And, um, and it is going to be about how can we use classical machine learning approaches to tackle uh, this problem? And so let me remind you what the problem is. We have several domains and several languages. And eventually what we care about is building the best machine translation system for English Nepali, okay? So the correspondence between the NLP setting and the machine learning uh, framework is rather straightforward in a way, because if we have just a parallel data set, then we are in the classical emp empirical risk minimization supervised learning uh, framework. Once we add monolingual data, which is unlabeled data, right, then you are doing unsupervised or semi-supervised learning. Once you start adding more languages, let's say uh, you want to do English Nepali, but now you have many languages on the target side, and it's like multitask learning. Why, if you add many languages on the source side, it's like multimodal learning. And once you need to deal with multiple domains, then you need to think about domain adaptation techniques. And so I'm going to review some of the basic approaches uh, in each setting. And that will prepare us for understanding how can this work in a practical application. So this is very much what Horan, I believe, because I was not there, uh, explained this morning. We have uh, in the in the simple setting where we have a single domain. Okay, so your training and test uh, data set come from the same domain. You have only uh, a single language pair. You have a data set of X and Ys. X are sentences in English, Y in Nepali. Uh, in the supervised learning uh, framework, you have a predictor that goes from X to Y that predicts a probability distribution of Y given X. And that's a transformer, an encoder decoder SIG to SIG model. And uh, in my little diagram here uh, on the left, you have that uh, your X goes through the encoder decoder, produces a prediction. 
and uh, and the loss function measure some sort of discrepancy between that prediction and the human reference. So there is a human translator that uh, took the X and produced the Y, and that's your golden reference, and you're comparing the two of them. Now, I'm not going to go into details of this, but essentially you're going to decompose the target sentence into a sequence of tokens and, and apply classical cross entropy loss to them. The challenge here is that you may have little label data, right? And so you need to regularize. And typical ways to regularize is by adding noise to the hidden states, like we drop out, or by doing other things like label smoothing, where you, instead of predicting a one hot vector, uh, at every position for every token, you eat a little bit of probability mass from the correct token, from, from the correct prediction, you spread it around all the other alternative uh, um, uh, classes that you have. All right, so this is standard. So let's see what to do if we have also monolingual data, in this case on the uh, source side. So as you can see on the top, now we have in addition to the parallel data set D, we also have a data set M, capital M, that consists of a collection of source uh, sentences, okay? In this case, sentences in English, but you don't have the corresponding translation, okay? So uh, we can do, you know, what people do in machine learning, which is you try to model P of X in addition to P of Y given X. And one way to model the P of X in, in this context is by using a denoising autoencoding. You can do also other things by, by no means, but this is an example. And so um, remember that eventually we want to train an encoder and decoder. So the encoder is this blue box that operates on an English input and the decoder is this red box that operates in Nepali. The denoising autoencoding allows you to uh, have more training signal for the encoder, for this uh, blue encoder box. And the way, the way it works is that you take a, a sentence from the monolingual data set, this XS, you add noise to it. In this case, adding noise means, for instance, you drop words, you swap words, okay? You feed it to your encoder decoder, where the encoder is the thing that you're going to plug in your machine translation system. And then you try to predict the clean uh, input, okay? And you know you can combine the two loss functions. You can pre-train the encoder this way, and then fine-tune using the parallel data set. Anything, I don't think there is a big difference between the two things. Okay, so that's one way to use monolingual data on the source side. Another way is to do self-training. So the idea self-training is a very old algorithm from the I think the early 90s even, and, and it's very simple. And so um, you take a sentence from your source side monolingual data set, you add noise very much like before, but now you don't have an autoencoder. You have actually your machine translation system that goes from English to Nepali. So you produce a translation of that sentence of that noisy English sentence. Now, we don't have the human reference, right? So what do we do? So you take a stale version of your machine translation system, which is what you see. Now, I don't have my, what is it? Uh, I don't have my cursor anymore. So uh, look at the diagram at the uh, left, at the bottom left. At the bottom, you have a path that goes through an encoder decoder that is frozen, right? So this is a stale version of your machine translation system. And that's providing you a pseudo reference y bar okay and now you try to match the prediction of from the current version of your machine translation system with the noise input to this uh, machine generated reference why this work at all uh, essentially the idea is that two things so first of all when you produce the reference y bar you use beam decoding right and so you force the machine translation system to learn the decoding process, number one. Number two, you inject noise. And so you force the encoder to be invariant to that noise, very much like in the noise encoding, okay? So the advantage, the advantage compared to the noise encoding is that here you train both the encoder and the decoder. The decoder learns to learn the decoding process, the beam decoding, and the encoder learns to be invariant to noise, okay? And again, as before, you can combine the two loss functions. And so you train the parameters of your encoder decoder by 
uh, minimizing some weighted sum of, of the supervised learning loss on the parallel data set and this uh, self-training loss. You can see this approach as augmenting the original parallel data set D with another parallel data set, which is machine generated, where you have noisy inputs and machine generated translations. Okay. So it's a data augmentation approach in a way. Um, so I think I already explained the algorithm. Uh, I hope it is clear. Uh, um, another setting is uh the following when the monolingual data is on the target side as opposed to the source side so um in this case you have in addition to the parallel data set d you also have a monolingual data set m superscript t right that collects y's so uh sentences in a party one way to leverage this kind of data is the following you first train a backward machine translation system that goes from nepali to english Re remember what you want is something that goes from english to nepali but you don't do that at first at first you train a, a machine translation system a backward machine translation system that goes from nepali to english using your parallel data set d okay and that's your in the on the left hand side your enco enco red encoder blue decoder box okay and you use that system to produce translations of your target side monolingual sentences. So for a YT, you produce an X bar, okay? And then voila, you have your input to your uh, forward machine translation system, and you simply augment uh, the parallel data set D with this artificially generated data set, pairs of X bar, YT, okay? So the algorithm, is the following you first train a backward p of x given y machine translation system on the parallel data set d you use it to decode the monolingual data set to produce the data set 80 and finally you train your forward model p of y given x on the union of d and this 80. okay so the advanced so it's different from self-training because the data is different and the difference is also that here the target is correct. It's just the, the input to the machine translation system, this X bar that is kind of noisy because it is machine generated. Um, all right. And of course you can combine these two things, right? So if you have monolingual data on both source and target side, what you can do is first you train a forward and a backward machine translation system, a P of X given Y, a P of Y given X, on the parallel data that you have t and then you can uh, start an iterative process iterative process that alternates between two phases one is, one is generation and the other is parameter update in the generation phase you use the forward machine translation system to decode the source side monolingual data set okay that produces your as and then you can use your backward machine translation system to decode the uh, target side monolingual data that produces your data set 80. And then you concatenate the parallel data set with these additional two uh, artificially generated uh, parallel data sets to retrain both P of, X, P of Y given X and P of X given Y. And then after you retrain, you can redecode and, and repeat this process. Okay. All right. So we have seen how to leverage unlabeled data. At least this is, this is, I would say, the most popular and so far effective way to do so. Let's see how to deal with multiple languages. So it turns out that this is a piece of cake. So now, in addition to your English Nepali data, you may have also, let's say, English Hindi data. Uh, let's say that you only have um, parallel data sets. Uh, uh, to make the long story short, uh, the most effective way uh, was introduced by John Sosetto in 2017. And the idea is to share all parameters of, of the sig to sig model. The only thing that you need to do is to add an extra token to your uh, transformer at the input on the source side to specify the language that you want to translate your uh, uh, sentence into. 
And so this uh, language token is a language specific em embedding essentially that you, that's the only thing that is specific to that language pair. So let's say you want to translate from English to Hindi, you prepare the Hindi uh, token. If you want to do English to Nepali, you instead swap the Hindi token with the Nepali token. That's the only difference. All the other parameters are shared. And so you do standard cross entropy loss. Uh, you just need to remember to add this extra token to input. And the transformer magically will figure out how to leverage this extra token to translate in the correct language. One uh, word about domain adaptation. There are, it's actually very complicated because there are several ways in, in which you can have a domain mismatch here. In the simplest case, you have a domain mismatch between the training and the test side. And again, there are a lot of approaches. The, the simplest one, and that takes you 90% of the way, is fine tuning. So you simply train on your parallel data set that is out of domain, but that's okay. It's a lot of data. And then uh, you use uh, a little bit of in-domain data to fine tune. And, and that uh, takes you a pretty long way. So um, to make the long story short, there are several pretty basic machine learning approaches that can be combined together to uh, tackle the low resource machine translation problem. If you notice, there is nothing in the architecture nor in the learning algorithm that is specific to the language pair. And that's the beauty of it. And that's probably what you want to do. Uh, if you want to like, if you want to have a service that for a lot of different language pairs. Each language pair would be a task, right? And so you let the model learn from data what the task is. And like in um, other domains, like in vision, I would say that a very powerful way to improve generalization is via data augmentation. And here we use an inductive bias. So machine translation is a particular uh, uh, learning task where that is symmetric. So going from X to Y has roughly the same complexity than going from Y to X. And that's why back translation is applicable. It doesn't make sense to do back translation in image classification because generating an image from a uh, class label is much harder <laughs> than the vice versa. And so that's where we use the inductive bias, but it is a very um, you know, uh, weak way to do that, but yet important, I would say. Um, so the conclusion so far is that although the kind of building blocks are seen, how combined is where the math is, and it's another not uh, uh, to a priori combine these building blocks. In fact, there is a very complete interaction between generalization, uh, domain, spare capacity model, amount of data that you have. Um, Let me give sorry. you an example. We, we cannot it hear you very well be, anymore. Yep. Um, the audio is... Oh, uh, sorry for, for this hiccup. Um, so let's see how these building blocks can be used um, in, in, some specific, in some use cases. So the first use case is unsupervised machine translation. And here, uh, let's consider the case in which we only have monolingual data. Let's say we want to translate between English and French. This is not what you, you know, you're interested in, but it's more like a, an academic study to see whether we can possibly learn in an unsupervised manner. So you only have monolingual data, a bunch of uh, sentences in English without the corresponding translation, and likewise, a bunch of sentences in French without the corresponding translation, the same domain, okay? So what you could do uh, is you take a sentence from uh, the French data set, and you pass it through a, a backward machine translation system, a P of X given Y. So given the Y, you can uh, produce a translation X bar, and the next slide, then you can uh, feed that to a, oh man, there is such a delay in the slides for me. Okay, maybe. Yeah, and then you can feed that to uh, a forward machine translation system 
like in the back translation game that we saw before, right? And so this is reminiscent if you uh, follow the vision literature to what people have done uh, in vision and um, with uh, autoencoders and cycle consistency. And in their case, uh, the input and uh, the source and target domain were images, right? And the question why you do this autoencoding game where the intermediate representation is in, the, in our case, uh, an English sentence, is to make sure that what you produce belong to the domain of interest, right? And in their case, they used a adversarial loss to make sure that the image is a natural image from, from the domain that you want. In our case, it is difficult to apply the same adversarial training loss because we have a sentence, right? A sequence of discrete tokens. And so, next slide. What we can do to make sure that X bar is a um, uh, valid English sentence is to make sure that the decoder, that blue decoder box, produces valid English sentences. And one way to do that is by um, adding a denoising of the encoder loss. So you take an English sentence, you add noise, and you go through an, an encoder decoder. Uh, uh, box that processes English sentences, and you force the decoder to produce, you know, um, fluent English sentences. So, um, but if you do this, actually this doesn't work. And the reason is because the decoder, this blue decoder box, may operate differently depending on which representation you fit it to. So if you produce the representation using the blue encoder box, it may work, but if you feed the representation produced by the red encoder uh, box that uh, was fed with a French sentence, the two representations may be different and the decoder may operate differently in the two situations. So in other words, there is lack of modularity. It's difficult to have to mix and match these red and blue boxes. And so one way out of this, next slide, is to share parameters, to have a single encoder that works both for English and French and a single decoder that works for both English and French. And uh, we share all parameters and we specify the language ID at the input uh, as I described uh, before. And so next slide, you, are, you can see that um, again, we combine uh, the building blocks that we uh, discussed before, iterated by translation, denoising of encoding, and multilingual training. Next slide. And so this is a, a typical result that you get. The dashed line is the performance of two different ways to do unsupervised machine translation in the way that I just described. And the continuous line is what you get by doing supervised learning using two different approaches. One is a neural approach and the other is a phrase-based model. So what's interesting to see on the x-axis is the amount of parallel data that you use to train the supervised system. And so you can see that the unsupervised approach that uses 10 million monolingual sentences achieves the same performance as the supervised approach with 100,000 roughly parallel sentences. So in other words, each parallel sentence is worth about 100 monolingual sentences. And this is in the ideal case in which the two languages are fairly similar and in which there is no domain mismatch. Now, the more the languages are distant and the more there is domain mismatch between the source and the target monolingual data, the more data you will need. And so you can see how, already from here, if you want to do low resource machine translation, you need much more data than when you do supervised learning because you don't have direct supervision, so you compensate for that indirect supervision by having a lot and lot of data. Okay, so next slide. Um, let me skip this and, um, well, let's see how much time do I have, Francesco? Um, let me see, uh, so you, you can Take uh, ten minutes more. Okay. So maybe let me let me let me. Um, so maybe go to the next slide. Next slide. So okay. I'll stop here. So this is another example. This is Nepali English, exactly what we were discussing before. And um, 
It turns out that in this case, you don't have any in-domain parallel data. And so the blue bar shows you what happens if you use supervised and supervised and uh, monolingual data on the source and target side, just for Nepali English. And you can see that unsupervised uh, really doesn't work in this case. However, if you add also English Hindi, okay, and now you have parallel data for English Hindi, now you have the red uh, bars. In particular, if you look also at unsupervised, now it is unsupervised for Nepali English, but it is supervised for uh, English Hindi. And you can see that adding that kind of supervision, okay, really helps you also doing unsupervised translation for Nepali English, which is quite interesting. Um, okay, so let me, I had a demo for you, but unfortunately, I won't be able to show it to you for uh, Burmese. And so let's go to the last part of the talk and, and leave uh, time for questions. So let's skip this English Burmese. Uh, skip, skip, skip. Um, right, we can skip and go here. Um, yeah, so here the conclusion is that we have a few building blocks that we combine. And the idea is that you know, really, to get low resource machine translation to work well, you need big data and big compute. Okay, and and uh, and in general, if you have little supervision, you may really want to consider to scale up as opposed to scale down your model. So next slide. So let me offer some perspectives. Next slide. So there are a lot of things that I didn't talk about. In particular, we focused on modeling, uh, machine learning approaches for low resource machine translation, but there are a lot, there is a lot of research to be done and that doesn't necessarily need a lot of compute uh, for data collection and analysis. In particular, there is a big challenge in terms of evaluation, for instance, of low resource languages and uh, collecting benchmarks for that is actually, there is not a real science as far as we know right now, it is um, really difficult because if you don't speak the language, number one, you need to come up with good statistical tools to assess the quality of human translators, right? Uh, analysis, um, analyzing the, uh, the mistakes that the model makes, analyzing how the model fits the data. Uh, again, uh, you need pretty sophisticated tools because it, it is, you know, um, we are in the space of sentences and that's not something that is very easy to analyze. I didn't talk about filtering. That's another important building block. In particular, when you don't have uh, 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 human uh, translations, you need to uh, source data in an automatic way. And uh, there has been a lot of excitement in the community about ways to gather uh, parallel sentences in an automatic way by mining the internet. And I think uh, figuring out how to combine bad translation, pre-training, multilingual training, and filtering all together is uh, the current state of the field and the current challenge as, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, of course, I think also Orhan mentioned this. Uh, here we have been focusing on translating single sentence, but um, you can do much better if you have more context. Context that can come from the document where the sentence has been taken from or from other modalities. In particular, if you want to translate from, um, let's say, English to Italian, this deduction is underspecified because in English you don't often uh, specify the gender, while in Italian you do. And so if you have access to the document, you may understand that that pronoun refers to an entity that is female, let's say. Um, we talked about scaling up, and of course, there are engineering challenges about how to um, train this efficiently in a reasonable amount of time, how to make efficient prediction with these very large models. Next slide, please. Um, and of course, there is the challenge of how to deal with the long tail languages for which we have very little data, uh, very little digitized data. And for some, I don't think there is much hope, but sometimes you have monolingual data and that may be enough to uh, learn uh, some uh, machine translation system. There is the problem of bias 
like in the example that I made before, if you go from English to Italian, it is under specified. And how would you translate the word director, right? Um, what gender do you pick? And so uh, if you do BIM decoding, you're going to pick the most frequent uh, occurrence of that word. And so there is a question of UI, there is a question of how to uh, present a diverse set of translations that reflect uh, all possible ways to translate. Uh, there are challenges related to the metrics. In general, it is hard to judge the quality of a text generation system. And even um, to assess the importance of different mistakes. Let's say that you want to uh, translate news for the stocks and ch stocks exchange. And, and and you replace an entity, let's say uh, Coca-Cola with Pepsi. You know, it is a single word. You may have translated everything correctly, right? And so blue may be 90, but that mistake may cost you a lot of money, right? And so not all mistakes are born equal. And looking at these rare uh, mistakes uh, is difficult. How do you do it? What is a good methodology to do this? Uh, since I work at Facebook, I can um, attest that translating idioms um, is difficult. And the way that people talk in social media is, uh, is not very formal, right? And so you have people coming up with new words every single day, and you need to deal with a lot of um, uh, different ways to spell words. Uh, and so... Uh, can we build a machine translation system that is robust to these things? Next slide. And so um, my conclusion is that working on um, unsupervised or, 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 or methods that require little supervision is not an academic exercise. It has a lot of practical applications, and here we have talking we have, we have uh, talked about uh, one of them. And usually it doesn't pay off to scale down the model because you have little supervision, but do the opposite. So uh, consider a lot of auxiliary tasks. The model will need to be much bigger because it will need to learn many, many more things. And hopefully among one of them, there will be something related to the task that you're interested ultimately. And, um, uh, and in particular for machine translation, it is nice to have approaches that are language agnostic, and this lets you scale to lots of language pairs. Next slide, please. So uh, a couple of words about debugging. Um, first thing, uh, look at the data. Um, that's that's, uh, that's uh, rule number one in general. You need to familiarize, uh, familiarize yourself with the data, look at basic statistics, in our case, sentence length, token frequency, make sure that you deduplicate data sets. You know, there is no overlap between training validation and test sets. You may laugh, but believe me, in my career, I've seen uh, many uh, issues related to these basic things. And then uh, adopt a reproducible approach. Just releasing code doesn't make you uh, uh, reproducible in the sense that if your code is full of data uh, data dependent hex, it's not quite what we want, right? So it doesn't have the community move forward. And so uh, try to first reproduce what other people did and build on the top in a, a bottom up uh, way. And this also is a good way to debug because if um, yeah, if as a corner case of your approach, you have something that is known to work in a certain way, you should be able to reproduce it. And then look at what the model is doing, right? So look at the generations, look at uh, patterns in the generations, uh, like repetitions, whether the generations are too long, too short, or, or what the model is picking up. Next slide, please. There are... Uh, Basic suggestions on uh, debugging when you train these six to six models, uh, checking whether your optimization works. For instance, you can take a, a small uh, portion of your train set, like a few mini batches or even a single mini batch, and you should be able to nail to zero the training loss. You should be able to memorize it. It's not useful, but make sure that you know the optimization can work. If it doesn't, uh, well, 
you know, check if you messed up the gradients, if you implemented a new module, or check the initialization, normalization layers, how you set up uh, the optimizer hyperparameters. Uh, a big deal in low resource machine translation is overfitting. And so it is very useful to plot the training validation loss over time and should be able to get that typical textbook picture of the validation loss going down at some point uh, going up. And so ways to overfight, uh, to fight overfitting is, uh, as we discussed before, using dropout, label smoothing, adding noise, uh, add bad translation, do multilingual training. For domain adaptation, uh, it really depends what kind of domain mismatch you have, whether it is between the source and the target domain, whether it is between the training and the test uh, sets. And uh, there are simple checks that you can do, right? So if you suspect that you have a mismatch between the, the training and the test distribution or the validation set distribution, you can take a uh, hold out data set from the training set, training on the remaining part, and then check that you generalize as well on the held out part of the training set as well as on the validation set. If you don't, then you may have a mismatch. And then you can think about different ways. Once you identify, once you understand where the domain mismatch comes from, then you can apply different techniques like tagging, fine tuning, or different ways to weight examples and data sets. And finally, don't fool yourself and other people. So, um, we are all a believer in what we do and in the models that we propose, but you need to make sure that the baselines are strong and well-tuned. So that's, uh, that's always where you need to put a lot of effort. And next slide, please. So I want to conclude by saying that there are a lot of opportunities at Facebook, from internships to full-time positions, visiting positions. And next slide, please. So if you are interested, please feel free to email me. And I would like to thank my collaborators for um, all the work that they presented here. Um, and I'd be happy to take your questions and apologies again for the technical issue with the internet. Thank you.